Today we're going to talk a little bit about tides. Now you might think you know all about tides, the moon, the sun, the gravity, all that sort of stuff. You know what, I reckon 9 out of 10 people are going to be really surprised when I tell you all about how tides work in Australia, all across Australia, but I'm going to focus on two of my favourite places, the Gold Coast where I spend a fair bit of time and Weeper up on Cape York where I also spend a lot of time. So let's look at tides and hang around to the end and I'll explain different tides for different types of fishing situations so that you can become a better fisherman and work the tides. Now I'm sure everybody knows by now that it's the sun and the moon that has a gravitational effect on the earth that causes the tides. And let's have a look at this little diagram here where I've got an earth that's got no land at all. And let's just assume it spins perfectly on its axis. Instead of tilted like our axis is, it spins nice and straight. And if you have a look, when the, when the moon is aligned with the sun, it has a stronger gravitational effect and that's what causes our spring tides. And if we have a look at this diagram here, where the moon is at a 45 degree angle to the sun, that has a lesser gravitational effect because they're fighting against each other and that causes our lower or neat tides. So that in a perfect world would get the same highs, the same lows every single day. That we, the tides would be six hours and 25 minutes apart or 12 hours and 50 minutes apart for each high and each low. But it doesn't work like that because the world isn't doesn't spin straight up and down. It actually tilts it on a, I think from my science class, 23 degrees, I think our axis is. And the moon doesn't flow around nice and even either. It's on a bit of a tilt as well. So there's a bit of stuff going on there. But more importantly, as the water gravitates around and moves, wants to move around with the tides with this gravitational effect, it's got land blocking it. And the land is what has the biggest effect on tides. And we have three different types of tides. We have diurnal tides, which are, happen once a day. Diurnal means daily. And we have semi-diurnal tides. And we have mixed semi-diurnal tides. What the hell does all that mean? Well, let's put it real simple. Diurnal tides, one high tide, one low tide, once a day, that's it. Semi-diurnal tides are the most common ones. That's where you get two high tides and two low tides in a 24-hour day. And what a mixed diurnal tide is, is where you have two highs and two lows, but there's a massive variance between uh, the, the tidal range for one of the highs and lows and the tidal range for one of the other highs and lows. But our semi-diurnal tides are slightly different as well. And the reason why that is, is because of the axis that the world spins on. During the day in summer, the sun is in the southern hemisphere, for us anyway, so that it has a slightly stronger effect. And at night, when the world swings around, the, the sun is a lot further away, so it has a less gravitational effect. So we get higher tides in summer during the day and lower tides in, uh, in summer during the night. And that's switched around in winter, where we get lower tides during the day and higher tides during the night. And that's normal for all the semi-diurnal tide areas, where you'll just get that slight shift. So you'll get a bigger bump when you look at a tide chart, and you get a smaller bump when you look at a tide chart, just like this one here. But what a mixed semi-diurnal tide is, is a big difference between highs and lows. Let's have a look at this tide chart. This is from Weeper because Weeper has semi-diurnal tides and sometimes Weeper has diurnal tides. What? Why is Weeper so different? I want to explain to you what the land does when it comes to tides. The water wants to move around in a uniform fashion, but it can't because it hits land. And what it does, it creates little whirlpools or sloshes around. And I'm going to show you some water spinning around in a bucket. Now this water is going to be spinning clockwise and in the northern hemisphere it will spin anti-clockwise. And this is what happens when water that's moving around the earth so quickly hits land and it causes these little whirlpools. Now the very centre of that whirlpool is called the amphidromic point. Now the amphidromic point is stationary, it doesn't change. So high tide, low tide, doesn't matter the very centre of that whirlpool will stay exactly the same. Let me slow that, that whirlpool down a little bit for you as I spin the bucket. And as it, as it goes slower, you can see that one side of the bucket is low and the other side is high. And then as that water swirls around, it switches. The other side of the bucket is low and the opposite side is high. 
Now that's exactly what is happening around these amphidromic points, amphidromic points, sorry, around the whole world. And in Australia, we have one significant one, and it's on the bottom of southwestern Australia. It's one of the major amphidromic points of the whole planet. So a lot of tides are generated from that particular area. So the bottom portion of Western Australia has a very small tidal movement. And as we move further away from that amphidromic point, just like we do in the bucket, the further away we get from the bucket, the higher that water swishes up and causes that tidal range. So the top end of Western Australia has massive tides. The bottom end of Western Australia has tiny tides. And what I'm talking about is like, 20 or 30 centimetres difference in tidal range from high to low in the southern part of Western Australia and the top part of Western Australia, five, six, seven, eight metres depending on what stage of the tide we're at. Huge differences and that's because of that amphidromic point as well as the fact that the continental shelf comes in really quick because there's another thing that, that affects tides and that is that the tides are a wave. You've heard the term tidal wave that's exactly what they are. Tides are waves. Waves are uh, energy that's moving through the water. Now energy moves through the water or tidal waves move through the water depending at a speed that's dependent on how deep the water is. The deeper the water, the faster the wave moves through and more water will push through and go quite quick. Now as water becomes shallower, the wave actually starts to slow down. Exactly the same thing happens on a surf beach. What happens is the wave comes from out of the ocean and it's just cruising along and then all of a sudden it hits shallow water. The top of the wave keeps going a little bit quick but the bottom of the wave slows down so quick because the water's getting so shallow that the wave breaks and it falls over itself. Let's have a look at this map of Australia and it shows you where you get big tide ranges and where you get small tide ranges. The yellow is sort of average, the red's really big and the green and the blue, well blue's no tidal movement at all and green's very little. So. Breaking it up like that, you can see around the country, tide, the tide range varies so, so much. And that's all because of the deep water, the shallow water, and these amphidromic points. Now there's an amphidromic point in the South Pacific, somewhere between Solomon Islands and PNG. It's right up there and that affects the, the east coast of Australia. And, the, and of course we've mentioned the other amphidromic point down in the southern part of Western Australia at length. But there's another little amphidromic point and it's where I like to fish all the time and I fish up at Weeper and up throughout Cape York and in the Gulf of Carpentaria, because the Gulf itself is a big bay, there's an amphidromic point sitting right in the top of the bay and that whole bay just swirls around. So the Gulf of Carpentaria has its own little ecosystem when it comes to tides and it's really interesting. It slops, slops around just like the water in the bucket. Look, it's a fascinating little system. If you were in the Northern Territory at high tide and you flew directly across to Queensland in a perfectly straight line, you would arrive in Queensland at the same time and it would be low tide because of that bucket effect. Because of that amphidromic point being in the middle, it pushes one side at low tide and one side's at high tide. The other thing is, that the Gulf of Carpentaria slowly gets shallower and shallower as you go further down. So by the time we get to Mornington Island and Kurumba, Kurumba's all sand flats and mud flats. It's really, really shallow. And because that shallow water slows that tidal wave down so much, by the time you get to Kurumba and Mornington, it's a diurnal tide. There's only one tide change a day. Look, it's really, really confusing, but it explains a fair bit. The Gulf of Carpentaria is really complicated because it's got its own little system, same as the bottom part of Western Australia. Because of those aphrodromic points, they, the water swells around there and they, they don't really move too much at the points themselves and as you go further away from the point they get really big and depends on how deep and how shallow the water is, look it's all crazy stuff. But it just goes to show the importance of going to a new area and reading a tide chart. Look I hope this doesn't confuse you anymore but Weeper is its own beast in itself because diurnal tides in Weeper occur when there's not a lot of tide movement. So in between the new moon and the full moon, when you get unique tides, you will get diurnal tides in Weeper because it's pushed into the Gulf enough to start slowing right down. And when you don't get a big tidal shift or you don't get a big tidal range, it'll slow it down to the point where we're getting diurnal tides. But three or four days each side of the new moon and the full moon, we get mixed semi-diurnal tides. 
we get two tie changes, but one will be huge and the other one will be really small. And look, when you read a tide chart, it'll say you've got a 2.2 meter tide, or you've got a 3.8 meter tide, or you've got a 0.2 meter tide. What does that mean? Most of the time they measure tides off what's called the LAT, the lowest astronomical tide. You might see that written on a chart every now and again. And the LAT is what we measure the tide on. It's not uncommon to have tides that are lower than the LAT. So you might read a tide chart and the tide might read 0.2 meters negative. That's lower than the LAT. And at least you'll understand what it means. And look, the LAT could be, is just a datum point. You could measure the tides off a, off a white mark on a stick if you like. That'll work just fine. As long as you know that at two meters, I can get over this sandbar and at 0.5 meters, I'm gonna be high and dry. Look, that's all the stuff that you need to know. But how does it affect your fishing? When the tide has a massive tidal range, so I'm talking about a 0.5 low tide and a three meter high tide, that's a two and a half meter tidal range. We're gonna see a lot of water movement. So fish are gonna be really quite active. They're gonna work hard to stay in that water because it's moving so quickly. Bait fish are gonna get washed around a fair bit too. So it makes the fish pretty active. There is a saying that says no run, no fun. And I'm a big fan of that because the fish are a lot more active when you get a big tidal run. But what about the smaller tidal runs? Well, there's some places you can't fish when you've got those big tide runs. So when you get a tide that's say, a one meter low tide and a 1.8 meter high tide, where it gives you that 0.8 of a meter tidal range, it's not gonna run in as hard, it's not gonna run out as hard. So you can get your soft plastic down to that little reefy bit. You can fish around pontoons without it getting washed away too quick. And you can even throw a bait out without having a house brick attached to it to keep it on the bottom. But the fish are sometimes not as active. So what do you do? Look, you can go and find places where the tidal run's not so important. I sometimes fish canals when I'm on the Gold Coast. And when I'm up in Weeper, I'll go up the creeks or up the rivers a fair way where there's not gonna be massive tide runs all the time. And the fish are used to not having a massive amount of tide movement. But when the tide's really pumping, I can go chasing queenfish and trevally and all sorts of stuff that work really hard and chase all that bait fish around. And the harder they have to work in those big tidal runs, the hungrier they get because they're expending so much energy that those big tide runs are usually a really good time to go fishing. I like to fish leading up to the new moon and leading up to the full moon because the tides are slowly getting bigger and bigger. The fish are getting hungrier and hungrier. Bait fish are moving around a lot more and you actually catch a few more fish. But don't disregard those other times as well. Those slack uh, little neat tides are a great time to fish around bridge pylons and all sorts of stuff where you haven't got water movement that's just making it almost impossible to fish. So think about where you're gonna fish. Fish the beach even when you've got neat tides on because the beach, the sweep on a beach is dependent on how much water's coming up the beach, so swell and all that sort of stuff. It doesn't rely on neat tides or spring tides. So just mix it up a little bit, have a look at the tides and think about what you're gonna do when the tide changes or what you're gonna do when there's a neat tide on or what you're gonna do when there's a spring tide on. Fish that love drains, flathead, barramundi, stuff like that, they love those low, low tides during a spring tide. Because remember, a spring tide gives you a big high tide, but it also gives you a big low tide as well. So all those drains and stuff will drain into the main channel and the barramundi and the flathead will sit there chasing all the bait fish that come out. But what we've done today is we've come up one of my favorite rivers on Cape York, which is the Wenlock. And we've been here all day. We left, left Weeper at 5.30 this morning. There he goes. We left Weeper at 5.30 this morning. We came and hit this at high tide. We picked up some barra. We picked up, uh, well, we had a really good session on barra. Then when the tide dropped, we got a threadfin salmon. We got a big bite on barra. And we just worked our way back up the river. And the thing about drains is they really fire when the tide drops, but they fire even more when the barra are ready to push back up into them. And the tides just turned and started to run back in really hard. And this tiny drain just here that I'm showing you right now, we've pulled over 30 barra out of this one drain alone. So we've probably caught 60, maybe even more fish today in general. But as soon as the tide turned and started pushing up that little drain, all the barra lined up and the fishing's just been insane. We've had a ball. The tide's so low that the weed is sticking out of the water. It makes it very easy to work that weed edge. We don't want to spook the flathead that is sitting there. So I'm going into the current and I'm casting 
so that my jig head comes back towards the boat with the current and that way any fish that I run over the top of I've already run a lure past so I'm less likely to spook any fish that I'm sneaking up on we're going to catch a flathead off this weed edge for sure oh yeah there's one <laughs> <laughs> 